I want to talk about probably three main things here. Uh, first is uh, to give you a tiny bit of context on me, uh, just so you understand why I care about this stuff, uh, and also why I'm probably intensely biased in all of the things that I say. So take them with the kind of context they come with, which is kind of my understanding of the world, um, and uh, see the biases that you see within that. Um, the second thing I'll do is tell you about Jensen's mission. Um, so our mission is to build a machine learning compute protocol, um, very much a, a deep in protocol. Um, and finally, I'll tell you about the Jensen vision, which is to be the network for machine intelligence. Um, and hopefully these things will flow into each other in a kind of nice, followable way, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. It might jump around a little bit, depending on um, how the context goes. Um, but first up, uh, so like I said, I'm Ben. Um, my background prior to Jensen is in machine learning research originally. Um, so I started life doing a, a PhD in deep learning focused on neural architecture search, which is uh, searching the structure of potential architectures for deep neural networks at the same time as training those networks. You can think about it as this massive overhead optimization process on top of the optimization that you're doing of training a network. So it's ridiculously computationally expensive. You need essentially unlimited amounts of compute to do it. Um, and out of the end of it, you get a novel kind of neural network structure designed particularly for a piece of data or a kind of a data set that you're wanting to train a model on. So the idea is that um, any individual who wants to take, I don't know, a load of images and start detecting things in those images, they don't need to be a machine learning or neural network expert. They can run a kind of computation that searches for the best neural network and then trains that neural network for them, and then they can go and use it. Uh, and the kind of benefits of that are reasonably obvious, I think. It allows basically anyone in the world to do machine learning and use machine learning as a technology with without being an expert, but it has huge overheads that we'll kind of lead into uh, as we go. And so um, that was a, a bit of a foundational kind of experience for me doing that PhD. Uh, I was doing these searches. I needed access to compute, and I couldn't get it. It was ridiculously expensive. I didn't have very much funds as a PhD student. I could get together like $10,000 um, and see what I could buy. It turns out what I could buy was a couple of workstations from NVIDIA, and that was it. Um, and at the same time, there were labs from Google and uh, Microsoft who were doing similar work as me, but over thousands of GPUs in the data centers that they had. And I looked at that, and I looked at the techniques they were doing, and they weren't that complicated. They were the same things that I was doing. Uh, and I knew how I could modify, modify those techniques to make them better uh, and to find new ways of doing those searches, but I couldn't run them because I didn't have access to compute. Um, and that didn't sit very well with me uh, because I realized that if I was in that position doing the work that I was doing, there were likely many, many more people in the world in that same position who just didn't have access to this base resource. If they did, we'd probably move faster towards machine learning being ubiquitous ubiquitous as a technology, which at the time, and obviously still now, I think is inevitable for humanity, and I'd like us to move there as quickly as we can. Um, so that, that's me. Uh, moving on to the mission, so the Jensen Protocol. Um, what we build is a deep in protocol for connecting up any machine learning capable compute in the world. Um, so that's GPUs, it's the NVIDIA kind of GPUs that we all know and love, um, but it's also MacBook processors, for example, maybe iPhone processors, uh, Intel's hardware, ARM's hardware, AMD's hardware, anyone's hardware that's capable of doing machine learning specific tasks, we would like to connect up in a completely trustless network and provide as a resource to anyone who wants to train a machine learning model. Um, so this kind of cuts out those middlemen who right now, uh, like AWS and Google Cloud, they'll collect up those devices, they'll buy out NVIDIA's entire kind of production run, and they'll stuff them in a data center somewhere, and then they'll rent seek on top of it. Um, and as I imagine many people on this stage have said, uh, we think deep in networks can change the dynamics of that market. Anyone could be a data center, essentially. Anyone who has access to compute that's capable of doing machine learning work should be able to go direct to somebody who wants to do that work and give them access to it and sell it, basically. Um, and so Jensen sits in the middle and does that. Um, and the protocol is designed to be entirely trustless. Um, it connects up those devices in a typical peer-to-peer -peer network that you would expect. It has a proof-of-stake consensus mechanism that allows us to make decisions as a group where anyone can join the network, anyone can kind of fall out, it's fault tolerant, it's decentralized, um, all the kind of things you would expect. The big sort of problem that we focus on solving, or there's, there's maybe two, but the, the biggest problem we focus on solving is verification. So anyone in the world can just run this software on their machine learning capable device and start renting out access to it. 
in that situation, people are quite likely to lie. Uh, they are going to get paid. They would like to get paid for doing less work than they have to. Uh, we figure that that is just financially rational actions. So uh, we build a verification system that sits off-chain and rolls up on-chain that verifies the computation that those users have, have done. So um, if you do run machine learning compute, when you run it, you also run uh, a task to create a verification proof. That proof is probabilistic, um, it's cryptographic, and it's game theoretically secured. Um, we could go in forever into the details of that, but if you're interested, we have various kind of writing about how it how it works. But essentially, it's a kind of off-chain proof that gets proven on the chain at the, the kind of full consensus of the chain. Um, the final kind of big problem, I guess, or big thing to focus on with the, the mission, the building of this compute protocol, is how do you use that efficiently? So say we've got all of the compute in the world. We're able to connect it all up in a peer-to-peer -peer kind of gossip network. It can all talk to each other. We're able to verify everything that everybody does on that network. So we know that every piece of machine learning computation that gets done is done correctly. How do we most efficiently use that network? And this is a kind of barrier that the ML world is struggling to get its head around. I think the crypto world is probably more kind of open to the, the prospect of it. But essentially, it says, look at the way people are training machine learning models right now. So look at Facebook, uh, look at Google, uh, look at Microsoft. They're all training these highly centralized foundation models that require hyper-fast interconnects between their compute. The Jensen network won't look like that. It'll be loads of these edge devices, along with some kind of islands of data center compute as well. And so the way you build a model over that has to look quite different. Um, so we do lots of research on how you can efficiently use this network. So once it's up and running, how can I train a model over a weird subset of that kind of graph of compute? But we also do research on what comes next. So what's after we've us making like Llama more efficiently train over this network? In our view, it's entirely new foundation models. It's new ways of viewing machine learning. And so that leads us into the kind of final third of this, which is the sort of vision part. Um, we have a very specific way of kind of viewing the future of machine learning in humanity. Um, we kind of go down to first principles and we say machine learning as a technology is essentially a really effective compression me mechanism. So it takes real world data, um, so data about this room for example, um, and it compresses it down into parameter space that can be interrogated very effectively with different kind of modalities of data. So for example, if I wanted to describe this room in humanity's knowledge base right now, I would write about this. I would describe this in natural language and I would put it on Wikipedia. And that's the way we've been doing it for decades. We've been kind of describing things as humans and then putting them into a shared knowledge base, which is the internet. Now we have this technique where I could take sensor data from this room and I could compress it into model space. And then in the future, somebody could interrogate that model space and pull out images. And they could pull out video, they could pull out audio, they could pull out text, they could, transfer, they could move through the space and pull out uh, commonalities between this space and the one next door. And they could generally interact with information about this space in a much, much richer way. And so when we think about kind of foundation models and talking to LLMs and things, we think that's an interesting demonstration of how you interact with parameter space. But what's the real long term for humanity? In our view, it's that compression into parameter space happening constantly, all of the time. Um, so all of our devices, they're all covered in sensors. We're getting more and more sensors. You see like Tab and the Rabbit device and the Humane Pin and things like this. We're all kind of gathering up devices. They're going to sit alongside us and they're going to monitor the world around us. And they're going to want to compress that somehow into something that we can talk to. And in our view, that is parameter space. Um, and so the, the future of machine learning, we think, is this highly, highly decentralized process of compression and then kind of decompression of rich real world information so that we can all interact with it. But that needs programmatic access to compute. It can't be going via us booking time on a GPU that AWS is selling us when we need it. It needs to be instantaneous and always on. It needs to happen on our devices. It needs to happen in data centers. It needs to happen basically everywhere. And so that brings us back to the mission. We want to build the network that connects all of that up, that provides those computational resources to anyone who's doing that machine learning process, that compression process, at any point in time on any device. There's a crucial kind of final piece to the, the vision, which I think it gets a little bit further out and kind of it gets into some of the things that a lot of people are talking about this week around agents, AI agents on chain and things like that. But we don't go quite that far. What we say is if you view this kind of world that I've described where we're doing that compression process all of the time on all of our devices, that compression process 
isn't really kind of interrogable by humans in the way that the Wikipedia entries would be. We're not going in and kind of changing which entry is where, and we're not kind of reading the individual database entries. We're actually interacting with parameter space via interfaces, via these text models or these image models or things like that. And that's an abstraction that, that sits between us and the data itself, which is it's hard for us to kind of come to terms with. We have to start trusting the machines themselves to interact with the data on our behalf, but in exchange, we get these huge benefits. So we get the ability to inter interrogate the space in this really interesting way. Um, but if you extrapolate that out even further, you say, well, machines are starting to curate humanity's knowledge base on our behalf. How, how does that go to the next stage? And our view that of the next stage of that is those machines then start to have agency. They need to have access to the core resources required to do the compression and decompression. And at the beginning, maybe that's just some simple automation. It's just machines using APIs and things like that. But as it gets further and further and, and gets kind of um, scaled out further and further, those machines need deeper access to those resources. And we think that leads to an economy for machines where they're accessing the resources themselves and we're setting kind of rules around the way that they do it. So we get to define the kind of world and environment that they live in, um, but they do live. And we aren't seeing every transaction that they make, for example. The machine that is training a new model that represents this room, I don't need to kind of shepherd that machine to do that. I can just set some rules in place and I can let the machine do it. And I can trust that with those rules, the machine can do it itself. Those rules are a protocol, essentially. They're just us defining protocols that allow technology to do enormous good for us in a way that we just haven't had access to before. So the final kind of piece that we, we see is humanity's knowledge base has been kind of progressing through time. Our ability to sort of distill information into something that we can store and we can pass around. Um, it started with, for example, just being able to write. And then it moved to like the printing press where we could disseminate. And then it moved to the internet where we could kind of share and constantly update. The internet started in this read-only paradigm where people thought there'd be a few, a few internet kind of websites that we would all just read from and that'd be that. And then it moved very quickly into all of us writing constantly in social media. Um, the next progression in our view is all of us compressing. It's all of us taking sensor data and putting it into that world knowledge base. But it's going to be using those machines. It's going to be via the machine curators. And those machine curators need rules to operate within. They need programmatic access to resources. They can't be talking to a support person at Amazon because their GPU has gone down. They need that to be kind of seamless and instantaneous. Um, and so that's the long-term view of Jensen, is to build the network that those machines can kind of live alongside humans on and do that curation process, but fundamentally provide programmatic, instantaneous, trustless access to all of the resources that sit underneath machine intelligence as a technology that allows us to have this much richer interaction with the digital world. And essentially, it leads, in our view, to this sort of digital twin of the entire world that exists on the internet and is continually updated. It's continually trained by all of us. It's continually interrogated by all of us um, any time we're kind of interacting with it. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, that's the long-term vision. It starts with compute, which is the deep-in protocol that I described earlier, but it encompasses all of the kind of different protocols required uh, to enable this machine-human knowledge curation process. Thank you.